All right, in this video, we're gonna look at proving that this limit is true. So you should be saying, I, I don't need proof, I believe that that limit is true. Uh, you should have developed enough intuitive sense about limits at this point that you can pretty confidently say that when x is close to three, x squared is close to nine. Uh, you can think about a graph. I'm going to go ahead and draw a graph, even though you don't necessarily need a graph to think about this limit, because uh, it will help us in the actual proof. All right, so we know y equals x squared uh, when x is close to 3, right, the y values are close to 9. And in fact, when x is equal to 3, y is equal to 9, but remember that that's not what a limit is really about. It's not about equality, it's about being close but not at 3. Okay, but because this is a nice function, a parabola, it doesn't do anything weird around x equals 3, we can use what we know happens at x equals 3 to help inform what we think about this limit. Okay, so we feel pretty confident that that is the right limit, but that's not what this asks us. It asks us to prove. So when you see something that asks you to prove a limit, that's asking you to use that definition and really go through the proof of that. So we've done several other easier problems. This is a harder one because the graph is not a straight line. It's not symmetric on either side of x equals 3. So there's going to be a little bit more subtlety to the middle of this proof than some of the other problems. But you should know how to start the problem, right? Uh, you want to say that you're starting the proof so that it's clear what part of what you're writing is the proof and what part is scratch work off to the side. All right, and the beginning of these proofs always start the same way. We start by reminding ourselves and the reader of the proof about that definition of what this limit formally means. So we have that epsilon. So we say, let there be some epsilon that's greater than zero, however you want to say that. This is how I often say it. Uh, the next line of the proof is generally something about delta. And what we want delta to equal, that's when we need to do some scratch work and figure out what delta is going to equal. So I'm just going to put a little blank right there, and we'll go back and fill in that blank based on our scratch work in a second. The next line of the proof is generally something about the x minus c being less than delta, the absolute value of that. So uh, this is just straight from that definition. All of these proofs have kind of these parts that are the same, no matter what the middle of the proof looks like. Uh, so this is straight from the definition. 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c, so x minus 3, less than delta. And then the next few lines are going to be some implications that lead us, hopefully, to what we want at the end, which is an absolute value expression that involves epsilon f of x minus l, the absolute value of that less than epsilon. And so that's the, at the end of your proof here. At that point, you've completed the proof. We want to go back and fill in what needs to go in here. At that point, you've completed the proof. We often write a little sentence at the end and say, therefore, uh, we've shown what we claimed to show. All right, so this is kind of a skeleton of the proof, and we often go off to the side and do a little scratch work over here. So I'm just going to draw a line here, and here's going to be our scratch work. And we're going to figure out what we need to fill in this blank and what goes here to help lead us. Uh, when we have straight lines, a y equals mx plus b kind of function, it's pretty straightforward, and you can kind of learn how those work and these steps aren't too long. When you have functions that are not symmetric uh, about that x equals 3, so steeper on one side than the other, you're going to have a little bit of extra work to do. And there are several ways to write out this work that are also correct. OK, so on our scratch work, though, what we often do is work backwards, right? The direction of the implication for the proof goes this way. We need to start with this, and it needs to lead to that. But just like when you're solving a puzzle, sometimes you solve it from the backwards. So we're, that's, we're going to use our scratch work here. We're going to start with this and kind of try to do some scratch work to fill in what would, what would get us back to there. OK, so I have this absolute value of x squared minus 9 less than epsilon. 
And I know that I want to end up with some sort of expression like this over here. So there are a couple ways I can do this. I can open up this inequality. I did that on a lot of examples. Um, but one thing you might notice about this one in particular is that this x squared minus 9 factors. And one of the factors of x squared minus 9 is x minus 3. So I'm going to do this problem using factoring. If this didn't factor or didn't have x minus 3 as a factor, I might go ahead and open up that inequality and do some solving like we did in some of the other problems. OK, so uh, that factors into x plus 3 times x minus 3. Um, all right, so there's my x minus 3. Um, so I have the absolute value of two things times each other. So the absolute values will force everything to be not negative, 0 or bigger. And so when I multiply numbers and I have a positive answer, they could either both be positive or both be negative. But if I split this apart, this was in the part we reviewed at the beginning when we reviewed some inequality things. I can split a product of things inside of absolute value into two separate absolute values, the product of those two things. OK, so what I have right here uh, is we're kind of getting closer to what we want here. Uh, generally, when we do these kinds of problems and we have a line, a linear function, what I have out here might actually just be a number, not an expression, a number. And usually, we just divide through by that number, and that tells us what to let be delta. So a lot of times, students try that here. The problem is, though, this epsilon is a number, and your delta needs to be a number that maybe depends on that epsilon, but should not involve x. So if I divided through by x plus 3, I would have this expression here, uh, which maybe I would be tempted to let be my delta, but delta needs to be just a number that depends on epsilon only, not on x. So the issue is this absolute value of x plus 3. And if I could put some boundaries around that x plus 3 and or maybe replace that with a number, uh, then that might help me to figure out what my delta would be that would make this work. So this, when this graph is kind of helpful, uh, we remember that because we're doing this limit, x is going to be close to 3. So we could pretty safely say that um, since x is close to 3, Uh, that maybe we could say pretty safely that it would be between 2 and 4, that x would be between 2 and 4. Okay, this is different. This part here is different than we did in any of the other proofs we looked at. Um, but what I'm trying to do is put some numerical bounds on this factor, this x plus 3 factor. All right, so we could say that x is close to 3, so it's between 2 and 4. So then if I think about x plus 3, if I just add 3 everywhere in this inequality, I'm going to get that 5 is less than x plus 3 is less than 7. Right? Okay. So the reason I did that is because I'm trying to put some numerical bounds on this factor here. It would be nice if this were a number right here, and then I could just divide through by that. OK, so one of the things that we want to notice is that we want a less than inequality here. And I have this kind of double-ended inequality. So where the less than inequality is at is here. Right, so x plus 3 is less than 7, and x is positive, so the absolute values don't really change anything since x is over here close to 3. Uh, x plus 3 will be positive. So I don't really need to worry about the absolute values in this problem. If I were on the negative side, then I would need to be more careful about the absolute values. OK, so since x is close to 3, we know that this factor, we can safely say that this factor is going to be less than 7. So I'm not really replacing this with 7, but I can manipulate some inequalities we'll do over here in the proof. And I can say, well, then, if this were 7 times the absolute value of x minus 3 less than epsilon, we would maybe divide through by that 7. This is what we did with the lines. We had a slope here that we divided through by. And then there is what we used for our delta. Right? That's what we used for our delta in the problems. All right, so this is going to work, that I can use delta equals epsilon over 7. The way I write this up is going to be a little bit different than some of the other problems we've done. Uh, but I really recommend kind of setting up this skeleton, go do the scratch work, and then go fill back in what you need to. So here's my epsilon over 7 that I got from my scratch work. And then I'm going to fill in these steps and complete my proof. OK, so this inequality and then the implications need to flow. So from this inequality, generally what we do with almost all of the problems is whatever we claimed delta was going to equal, we just replace that in this line, this part. I 
I don't need this. This is part of the definition, I should say that. But notice I don't need that on my inequality at the end, so I don't need to work with it anymore. All right, so here I'm just going to replace the delta with the epsilon over 7. Okay, now how this is a little different from some of the others is that I'm not going to be able to just connect step after step after step like we did on some of the others. I am going to need to say something about this part here over in my proof, but it's really kind of the start of a new sentence. So there's the end of a sentence, and then we're going to talk about this part. All right, so since x is close to 3, we can say x is between 2 and 4. Right. So x plus 3, really what I want is the 7. I can say the 5 part also, but I can safely say that x plus 3, so I'm going to put here implies, I'm just going to worry about this part, x plus 3 less than 7. I could put the 5 here, it's not wrong, I just don't need it. And since that's all positive, I can also say that that's true with those absolute values. Okay, the reason I put the absolute values in there is because I've got my eye on this scratch work over here. I want them so that I can get them to here and then to here. Okay, so I have two inequalities, one that's about the absolute value of x minus 3 and one that's about the absolute value of x plus 3. So what I'm going to do is take this one. I could really take either one. Uh, I'm going to take this one that I have here next, and I'm going to multiply both sides of this inequality by this absolute value of x minus 3, both sides. As long as I'm multiplying both sides of my inequality by the same thing, and it's positive, that preserves the inequality. So I used this inequality here, and I multiplied both sides by the same thing. Okay. All right, the left side, I can then kind of work backwards through here. I could write this step here if I want, but I'm going to go ahead and just go back to here. So multiplying those two together on the left side of this inequality, I'm going to have the absolute value of x squared minus 9. Ooh, we're almost to where we want, right? Okay, so I should say implies here. Uh, and that's going to be less than 7 times the absolute value of x minus 3. Now, that's not what I want at the end. What I want at the end is this. Right, so I need to kind of look back at my work that I have here and think about how I can connect to that. But this inequality, 7 times the absolute value of x minus 3, I can then use that and this inequality up here to say, well, that's going to be less than then. I'm just basically taking this inequality and multiplying both sides by 7, I get an inequality here. So 7 times epsilon over 7. All right, so uh, this is a long string inequality, but the two pieces that I need here at the end are right there, right? And this is all one sentence with these inequalities this way. So this and this line, if I just condense it and use the parts I need and simplify what I have on the, the right end here, gives me that epsilon that I have here. And so then I've got the inequality I need. I've shown what I need to show. You can write a concluding statement at the end. Therefore, since epsilon was arbitrary or since epsilon was any positive number, we've shown what we needed to show, and this limit is true. I'm not going to write that here because of space, but we are essentially done with the proof at this point, so QED. All right, this is a difficult one. Uh, definitely harder than the linear ones. I would make sure you're good at the lines before you tackle some problems like this. I would look through this, look through some more examples. There are examples in the textbook as well. Uh, and try to wrap your head around what's going on here. But I would certainly say that if you struggle a little bit with this, that's perfectly normal. This is a hard thing. This is one of the hardest things we'll do all semester. And it's okay to struggle a little bit with it.